weren't sure if we were going to be able to do this, but uh, uh, many of you did RSVP and let us know that you were willing to come. And so we rolled the dice and here you all are. Thank you for braving the, 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 the snow and the wind. And also two free calendars with birds. Two, two free, free calendars with birds. Two free calendars. Okay. Later. Okay, we're going to have a long program, so I'm not going to say very much except it. Um, hot off the presses, newsletters. Pick them up this morning. They're going in the mail Monday. And so um, you people who are members, and I hope you all are members, are going to get yours in the mail. 12 pager. Uh, it's going to be a double issue because we well, we were so busy, we didn't do a September newsletter. So we're, we're making up for that with a double issue now. Okay. Do we have any new people who have never been here before? Okay. A couple of new people. You, sir, how do you happen to come here today and join with us? Me and my son. Okay. <laughs> who made who come? I made him. Ah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Glad that you're here. Young lady in the back. Yes. Welcome. The You're the guilty party. Okay. We'll try to entertain you. And you, sir. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're back. No excuses for your tardiness. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Sir, in the back. Good, great, thank you, welcome back. We have a two-part program. Um, John Prytab was going to do housekeeping. housekeeping. Are you doing housekeeping? We, we were all into division of labor. Janice. Welcome everybody. Just two things that I'd like to make everybody aware of. Please turn your phones to mute or vibrate or something because it really makes a lot of noise sometimes. And at the end of the program, we have to move out quickly. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all the food over to the office and everything can continue over there. The cleaning crew wants to come in as soon as we can get out of here. All right. That was it. After party in the office. Okay, so also, Tim, our vice. We'll get there. We'll get there. Obviously, you know. We have all kinds of new equipment. So we've got a brand new 77-inch screen here. because So you all can see. Can everybody see in the back there? Outstanding. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the new sound system. And so uh, we're really rocking and rolling and we're also setting this out to those who are viewing from home. Um, Tim, you're gonna say some words. That's right. So as an intro to uh, John's presentation, excuse me, I just wanna tell you a quick story leading up to this. So um, my wife and I every year go up to Maine, there's a little town called Lovell, which has been her family since at least 1815. And uh, one day the we went to a bunch of us to the little historical society up there, which is a little barn by the side of the road to find out about her, her family's history, which is the name of Dallinger. So we went into this little historical society and we said, what can you give us? What can we see about the Dallinger family? We thought they were going to go in the back and open up some old rusty, uh, you know, uh, file cabinets. Instead, they sat us down at the computer. They said, the word Dallinger, and we did that, and up on the screen came pages and pages of photos and documents and birth records and death records, and we were amazed, and we're looking at this for an hour or so, and I said to the docent, this is amazing, and she said, well, you didn't have to come in to see this. You could have done this at your own computer from home, and I said, you're kidding me. Now, where was the Canal Society? This is four or five years ago. We had all our archives crammed into a storage unit way out in Hackettstown, we go in, you take your life into your hands, searching for things. No one knew where it was. You'd have to use your 
flashlight in your cell phone to look at things. And I remember, seriously, I said this at the time, I looked at this program and I said, someday this is where the Canal Society New Jersey needs to get to with our archives. And I am very happy and proud to say that that day has arrived. And John Prudeau, who's our archivist, main person who made this happen. So everyone, give a big round of applause <laughs> for our, speaker, our archivist, John Prudeau. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Thank you, Tim, for the great introduction. <clears throat> My name is John. I am finally out of the archive, and I'm here to show you what we've been doing. Uh, first, I have a little confession to make. Um, after all the hard work, I feel that it's time to show it off a little bit. So if you'll indulge me. Um, while I spent a couple of years <clears throat> inside the archive organizing everything, I realized that this has been quite a journey that we have taken. Uh, so at some point, we all talked about it and said, you know what, let's let's enjoy it and talk about it and uh, show everybody what it took to get to this point. Uh, so before shots. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Stick around a little, Beers, and you'll you'll see. <laughs> Okay, so so here we go. Um, we're going to try and have a little fun with this too, and so you can sit back and relax, and reminisce a little bit. Some of you may remember some of this stuff. Let's see if that'll work. All right, trying to advance. Yeah. Down arrow, okay. That's the screen. That's the keyboard. I got the keyboard here, yeah, okay, got it. Thank you, it was frozen. <clears throat> okay, so from the beginning, we were incorporated in 1969. Here's a picture of the document. It's actually dated January 1970. So it took a few months to get it going and make it official, but that started it. So in the beginning, small, uh, only 18 accessions in the first five years, and not a whole lot, but they were some really good ones. So we were really off to a great start. Uh, so in the 70s and into the 80s, uh, really, we were adding to our collection little by little and establishing our name. So we, while we were telling the story, we had things like the Archives Club, where we would keep track of all the stuff we were collecting and talking about it and figuring out what to do with these things in the future. Yes. Or what stuff? We're getting to it. Yeah. You see the map, right, Beers? They were really spread out. Yeah. That was one place. Bathtub gin, maybe? Outhouse, maybe? No. Um, they were really well over. So, and, uh, you know, the people that were there at the time realized that something had to give. We had to put this stuff together. So the roots of it go back to then. Really, we were uh, uh, archives without a home. I found this in 1987, an internal memo saying the Canal Society is in need of a room where we can process our archival material and make it available to researchers. That's foresight. That's how many years ago? Right? Somebody thought about it and said, you know what, not only do we need to keep it in one spot, we need to be able to show people what we have. And I mean, and for, and for research too, to make it formal. You see Bill Moss's name. He is a uh, key player in all this. 
So that's what we were doing. We were looking for a home. One of the early stops was a church in Totowa, I think over by uh, Union Avenue in the 1990s. Here's a picture of it. I think we had that place we rented for a few years. Next stop was some place, I believe it was a storage facility in Mansfield, somewhere around the early 2000s. Early 2000s also, we started to rent some space in Hackettstown. And they all pretty much look alike, but this is what it would look like. Climate controlled, to be sure. But as you'll come to see, no room to do anything with, just enough room to store it. Okay, so I think at this point, uh, the society started to get serious, early, mid 2000s. We had the idea to put it into Phillipsburg, which I think was the old train station. You can see the front on the left and the rear of the building on the right, such as it was, but it, it, it was promising. Here's some of the internal pictures. An old building to be sure, but I think they made the best of it. And you can see a lot of the steel shelves and the cabinets and some of the boxes even the little dolly there. Okay, so I think by the mid later 2000s, um, it was out of Phillipsburg. We went to another unit in Hackettstown by 2008. And actually in this particular unit, you could see we actually had some room to do some work. <clears throat> that didn't last very long. We added an additional unit in 2010. Now you see the map cabinets. And while they hold a lot, they're also very wide. So that cuts into the room. To the left of that, you could see another little desk with some of the newsletters. So there was still a little bit of room to work and a folding table to boot. After many years in Hackettstown, uh, our team, led by Janice, and working with the realtor, after much uh, hard search, we found this place, 2022. So that was a good, how many years? 10 years, 12 years. This was, I think this was the first place we looked at, looked at other places, came back, settled on this. So on the left, you see the office in the beginning, and on the right was the archive room, looking much different now. And there it is, the present archive space. Uh, somebody mentioned, I think, Bob, it looked like we're pretty full already. Kind of. We still have a little room to grow, though, I can tell you that. But we do have, as you can see, we have a, a space to work. And the map cabinets or extra cabinets all fit in there. So we're very pleased with that. And so far, it has been great. All right. <clears throat> so the archives, as the Grateful Dead would, uh, would sing, what a long, strange trip it's been. 2021. All right, so that's when I got involved and started to looking at <clears throat> all the archives. I started with the Collada Collection, which is our biggest collection. And that kind of started the ball rolling. So we realized that once we got here, we were going to need a place to put our, our uh, archives. We were going to need some supplies. And we were going to have to do an inventory. Because as far as I knew, I don't know that there was ever an official inventory done. We're finished with that now. So our database, uh, we were talking about it before. Uh, <clears throat> this is the past perfect that you see up here. Uh, dashboard, if you will. And that's where you start. 
you get into the system and we had to manually put every piece of archive in there, give it a number, and we just go from there. And it, it took a long time, but we got there. What that does is we had some tech help to help us take the stuff that gets entered into the database. It goes to our website search so that if I put something in the database, within a few minutes, you could see it on the search tool. And this search tool is very good. It's got the fuzzy logic, if you will. <clears throat> you can put in a few keywords and it'll show you pretty much everything. So carrying the torch, um, I have to say that my job organizing the archives, it was made much easier uh, because we had a great foundation already started of preserving, storing, and even some cataloging. Here are some of the folks that did all that. So a tip of the hat, it made my job a lot easier. Once I figured out what the hell they did. <laughs> We figured it out. They, they gave us a good start. <clears throat> One of the little pieces of legacy, I don't know if you can see it. This is a box of string. I called it the Bill Moss string collection. Everything he had that he got his hands on that was being put into the archive was put in plastic and wrapped with a, some kind of naval knot system, right? Yeah. So every piece that I took off, I put in here. And pieces of tape, yeah. There's a few of them in there too. All right, how have we held up? I have to say, we've held up pretty well. All those units that we had all this stuff in, the climate control was good enough, and it was stored good enough, uh, that we have very few items that are in questionable shape that needed some conservation or that are fragile, very few. It's less than a fraction of a percent. So we're very proud of that. All right, after all that, and my tales of woe to get to this point, explaining how long it took and how hard it was, let's just do a little uh, sentimental journey of some of the archives that we've had collected over the years. 1969, this is our very first acquisition. It is a simple postcard of the canal in Bloomfield. 69.1, the very first. So again, humble beginnings, but it looks pretty good. It's a little frayed on the edges, but it looks pretty good. So everything is held up pretty well. All right, we're venturing into the 1970s. Some of our uh, better archival items are the lantern slides. Glass plates, if you will, with that negative look to them, but very clear images. In the 70s, we got some of our first, first canal paintings. This, is, I believe, is Mr. Meyer, Carl Meyer. He gave us a few. We have one in the office right now, and it's held up very well. Nice detail. Rare documents. This one, I believe, is 1822. That also doesn't look too bad. You can still read it. Artifacts and models. Here you see some rail, rail spikes, canal spikes, little models of boats. We have a lot of postcards, hundreds and hundreds. But some of them are colorized and some are very good detail. And here are some of those. Lambertville and Phillipsburg. All right, we're moving on to the 80s. Mr. Olin Boat, I don't know if you folks are familiar with him. He was a photographer, but he, and he was a painter as well. His images, and we have at least 133 of them, of the canal scene, Morris Canal scenes, uh, stunning. The clarity that uh, he uh, <coughs> his images had are are amazing, and if you could see closely, he used to inscribe everyone. 
with the date. Still more postcards. We have a lot of mechanical drawings. Here's one here of a summit lock or canal paintings. Some of these paintings were great because they combined the canal and the railroad. Log books, we have a few of those, some copies, some originals, but they really tell a story. We have some canal models. Some of them are in, in um, the museum up in Waterloo. Plenty of microfilm, still looking for a good reader to, to see what's on there. We know what's on there, but we, we're looking for a good reader, but uh, we have them and they're in good shape. Uh, many images and one original of the 1861 Ward profile map, which is a classic. It shows you Lake Apacon there and the east side and the west side and all the elevation changes. Just before the Civil War. Okay, moving along to the 1990s, more microfilm. We got a few more reels back then. One of our favorites is an interview done by our Joe Hannon with Dick Titus, who was an old canal boat captain on the Mars Canal. I think he lived to 107. At this point, he was 102. We have the video, which we've digitized. He was still very sharp. Okay, there you go. He's quite the, uh, the Renaissance man. All right, so some of our bigger collections, I mentioned uh, Barbara Collada. That, that collection is 25% of all our holdings. Uh, Corley for the DNR 2004, Jesse Wilson in the mid 90s. We got two collections from him, 2018 and 2022, I think. A very good old classic documents, a lot of LVRR, documents. Of course, we have a lot of photos, among them DNR Canal, and of course, Morris. Two thirds of our whole collection are photos. So we have a lot of them. Here's some of the collada. What we also have in the Collada collection are a lot of uh, copies, original copies of uh, Mars Canal Banking Company stockholder reports. Uh, we have a, a close to three dozen of them. And we recently got an original first copy. Collada also has a lot of interesting post abandonment photos mixed in. This one is one of my favorites. It's a sad picture, but it's down Newark. It's at the top of, uh, or midway through, plane 12. Looking nothing like it did back in its heyday. Now it's overgrown with weeds and everything else in disrepair. A lot of reports and studies. Cultural resource reports that mention the canal in there with some pictures. Other utilities crossing the canal, things like that. We have a lot of these. 2000s. Okay. Weir Maps, one of our favorites, done by uh, a survey engineer for the Lehigh Valley Railroad back in the 1880s, I believe it started, where they went out and mapped everything. And we have some of them, a couple original. Rare objects, here's an old toolbox, which I think is out in Waterloo. Nice detailed drawings. The one on the left is interesting. I have I, one of my favorites. It is the actual uh, electric plane over the canal in Newark. And on the right is a nice exploded view of the anatomy of a lock. So some interesting things. More photographs, more DNR, Morris Canal. This one's Plane 9 East in Montville. We have a bunch of pictures from the end of days of the Morris Canal. These are down Newark. They're smaller pictures, but they show uh, the canal as it was just before it was officially abandoned. So you're talking 1920s. 
A lot of reports. One of the famous ones is the Remuel Report of the Mars Canal Investigating Committee. The Society took a lot of trips back in the day, so we found some of them in there. Trip itineraries, maps, hand-drawn maps. We also have topo maps. Uh, here's some more with uh, development near the canals. Here's one in New Brunswick. We have some books that are accessioned. This is a favorite. This is from Mr. Richard Veit, The Old Canals of New Jersey from 1963. That's a good primer on the canal. Uh, some of our own authors, The DNR Canal um, by Linda Barth, and of course, The Mars Canal Across New Jersey by our Bob Goller. Many more photos. All right, 2010. Getting closer. One of our favorites, being preserved and conserved now. The Highlands Canal boat. Most of you know the story about that, how it was found under someone's house. The society picked it up with much trouble, but brought it up here. And now it sits in Waterloo. Many maps showing the canal route. This is pretty detailed. We have a lot like this. A lot of them are photocopies, but they're still good. Good references. Old documents. Some of them involve receipts, contracts, things like that. Our canal boat stove, 2021, I believe. That sits in Waterloo. That's one of our heirloom pieces. Some of our recent accessions. Land titles from the Morris Canal. It's a whole, three volumes. 1,800 pages. Every bit of land that was taken and signed off for. And a D&H Canal logbook, which we're still just getting underway reviewing. Okay, here's where we are. Over 800 accessions. Total number of items, about 3,800. <clears throat> it's quite a lot. We now have our searchable database, as we spoke about. Over 2,300 photos that are online that you can search. Uh, our procedures are updated. Uh, now we have in-person archive research. You go ahead on the website, make a, an appointment. You can come in and see what you want. And we're looking now toward uh, potential future partnerships with other organizations, which would be beneficial for both. So we've come a long way, but really we're kind of still at the beginning because there's still some work to be done. We got everything together in one spot. Now we have to figure out what the hell to do with it. All right, projects. We're working on a bunch of these. Joe and I just talked about that. Uh, computer enhancement. Okay, we're underway with that. Some of the equipment, you could see the great monitor here. Large map scanning. We're working with uh, the state archives and people, other people to help take some of these old maps like Weir maps and go ahead and scan them digitally. Uh, also other large scale volume digitizing for a lot of the stuff that we have, we're gonna digitize those drawings and reports and things like that and ultimately photos. We're also starting to look through our things for good research for stories. Some of them will appear in the newsletter uh, conservation we mentioned with the uh, Highlands boat and what I call optimizing. That's what I mean by what are we going to be doing now? We're going to be going back <clears throat> and seeing how is our things working? How can things be improved? We're going to do some testing. I do it occasionally. I get in the system and look for something. If I see a problem and it wasn't entered correctly the first time, I'm going to go back and fix it. So that's a constant process. So what we're saying is, uh, come on and pay us a visit. You can do that online, do our web search, <clears throat> uh, go online and you can ask for an appointment to come in and see things. We also have a big library in there with a lot of different things, including railroads and historical uh, topics, everything. That's all I have.
Questions for John. Any questions? John, thank you very, very much. A nice presentation. I just have a couple of comments as to how and why the Canal Society of New Jersey got started. Uh, about five years before the Canal Society of New Jersey got organized, the Pennsylvania Canal Society uh, had been organized and they were, yes, uh, the Pennsylvania Canal Society was organized and they were very active in doing field trips, et cetera. And they came over to New Jersey and they went over the Morris Canal and they made no secret of it. They were going to find artifacts, photographs, and anything they could on New Jersey canals and bring them back to Pennsylvania. Um, and they did. Uh, that's how the uh, Mar the uh, National Canal Museum got started in Easton. At the time, Harry L. Rinker was president. And uh, the, the, how New Jersey Canal Society got started was that Clayton F. Smith heard of the uh, collecting activities of Harry Rinker and his band from Pennsylvania and decided that he needed to form a Canal Society of New Jersey. And he did, and the rest is history. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Always appreciate that great background. Any other questions? Yes. We have another almost two and it's over two years, three years. Five year lease. Five year. So we're we're coming up on this year we'll be coming up on two years. I hope I hope so. It's it's been it's been great, really. Yes. Um, to be determined. I think right now we, at our pace, I think we'd be okay for now. But never say never. Yes, Bob. You know of any background of those four people and how they acquired their collection? Yeah. Just a personal. It's a mix of, of stories. Um, one of the things that we do as a uh, as an archive is that we put together a little history of each of the collections, and it tells you stuff like that. So if you want it, Bob, there's there's a binder there that helps explain a little bit where they came from, you know, besides their number and how many, you know, things like that. But that's one thing that we should offer as a, an archive. Yes. Yes. Oh, kind of spoiler alert, but uh, what about that boat that was stored under someone's house? Is there a story of how it got there? Uh, yeah. I think I think Joe can give you the 30-second uh, capsule. <laughs> Come and see us at Waterloo. <laughs> we have the boat there, and we just had it conserved, and there's a whole story and other archive, other uh, original can canal uh, equipment and canal uh, artifacts. And so uh, we'll be open again in the spring. Come and see the real thing. That's the best chance. <laughs> okay, anybody else before I turn it over? It's in a barn, it is, yeah. Yes. That's right. That's where it fits. <laughs> Inside, covered, yeah. Okay, I think we're good. Um, thank you. It's a very, very big artifact. Okay, well, the tech support is working here. This is, you know, a, a, it's a vast collection. It's a huge amount of material there. And so um, John describes it as accessions. I would say there's a huge amount of information there. And some of it is for people like yourselves. People give us things. And now that we have a place to put them, people give us more things. So um, if you come across canal-related items, if you have canal-related items that you are looking to deaccession, uh, de we now have a place to keep them and keep them safely. Um, and then again, back to information. The things are actually projects. People like Bob Goller who have taken pieces from the collection and put them together into stories. 
you know, all, all of these archival items are just wonderful. And it's very good that we have them when we keep them safe, but it's how you use them. And what John has done is making them useful. You, If you have a question, if you have a story, if you want to investigate a line of interest, you can do that. And you can do that from home, going on our website, putting in search terms, come and visit us. We've got a wonderful office that you probably have seen and you can see again after this presentation is over. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to be showing you a presentation that I just put together, how does things from the archives. So um, help us make it better. And um, I guess there was a question about how long are we going to be here? We're going to be here for a long time. And this is only just one part of what we do. Believe me, we have got so many projects, it makes my head spin around. So, okay, I think we're, yes. With great difficulty. <laughs> we had no idea how heavy this, how how heavy the bottom of the canal, but we didn't even have a whole canal boat that had been cut down by the fellow who had owned it. And, but we had really no concept of how heavy this thing was. It was, we had to trim it down. It had, it had been in one piece under the building, but the, it was uh, located on such a narrow, skinny lot uh, in order to continue the work um, the, of raising and preser preserving the house that it was under, uh, the boat had to be cut into two board sections and moved out. So by the time we saw it, 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 it the bow was in one piece, but the, the rest of it was stacked up in two board sections. And so um, we arranged with Mr. McKelvey's help and some other uh, volunteers, a huge project of having it moved from uh, Highlands to, um, to 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 Waterloo, and so um, it all got stacked up, uh, and and and, uh, and 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 trucked in a huge flatbed uh, vehicle that came to Waterloo, and um, the most of the board sections went in with not too much trouble, lots of heavy lifting, but the bow itself was so heavy. And we would imagine that we could ring a, sl ring a sling and kind of slide it into the right barn. And, but no, it was not going to go in. So we had to do a little bit more surgery to bring it in the next day. It's had to sit outside and wait for the next day. Yes, one of the surgeons is right here. Very Dr. Lauf here. With, he's a marvelous guy with a, with, a, with a saw. So anyway, it is now safe. In the white barn, uh, all stuck back together again, uh, and we do have uh, the whole front end of this uh, hinge boat, um, although we can't put it all back together again. The, the white barn is a large structure, but not big enough to put this boat all back together again. It's 45 feet long, you know, 10 feet wide, and it would fill up the whole space that it occupies right now without any room for people. How are we doing? Okay, can we go back? Okay. All right, this is kind of a um a magical mystery tour through the history of uh Booten and the Morris Canal. They've kind of have a lot of synergy together. They kind of helped invent each other. Uh, the, uh, in the 1820s, 1828 to 1820, uh, 1831, there, 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 there was no town of Booton as we understand it today. And the Bowers Canal was just being built and ready to be completed. And so they grew up together. Um, at the end of the story, as they were beginning to part company, this is a panoramic view of um, what they made together. This is the ironworks, the post ironworks uh, below the hill in, of, uh, in, in, in uh, um, and Booton. And here are the remains of the furnaces. And here is the Morris Canal up here. And here are all the buildings of the ironworks that are being used and abused and reused. Uh, and the town of Booton spreads all over the hill behind. But it was a long journey to get uh, to get there. Um, we're going to kind of take a look at the canal from uh, north of Booton through 
uh, uh, the the pond lock, and then down through the ironworks period, and take a look all the way up to to lock thirteen. Um, but the beginning before the canal, long before the canal, this is revolutionary war times. Before the revolution, there was the town of Old Booton, so the area down here, under. Um, so yes, I'm already calling it the Booton Reservoir. It's not the Booton Reservoir. It's the Jersey City Reservoir. Boost, even 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 Beers didn't catch that one. A very long time ago, um, the Ogdens who had um, done a, well, an iron business up in Ringwood and got tired of that and sold it to Mr. Haas and Cleffer came down and um, uh, bought property and uh, started a forging business at what was called well, Booton at the time became Old Booton. <laughs> Can somebody get me some water, please? Okay. And so you can see the outline of how it sits now. Under 60 feet of water, there was a forge and a splitting mill and a grist mill and a mansion house that the Ogdens lived in. What about the people that have a splitting mill? Ah, uh, it's a very, very long story. We don't have time for all the stories. So... <laughs> <laughs> okay well next time you give a tour you can you can you can include that one thank you tim yeah. okay much much better thank you sorry about that okay so um this was the old town of Booton. it passed through many hands um it was a water-powered um facility uh and eventually passed into the hands of another famous iron master, uh, John Jacob Face. There's his picture on the um, upper right. And um, the old <coughs> Ogden mansion stood uh, in the middle of all that, and that still survived. And Mr. Face moved from uh, Mount Hope and lived in that house for, for many years. Um, and eventually well, I guess he moved to Morristown first and then moved to to, uh, to Old Booton. But uh, that building stood for many years until uh, finally the coming of the Morris Canal changed the whole landscape. This is a view of the landscape uh, of Old Booton uh, in the early 19... Well, okay, th th this is the paper mill uh, in the late 1800s. Now, this is a picture... It's often bandied about and always misidentified um, as being a picture of the original forge and rolling mill that was built down there. Now it's a paper mill that was built much later in 1880. But you can see that vast open rolling land is what's under um, what's under the Booten River Reservoir. Something you don't get to see very much. This is a picture and the early. Um, 1900s, just before they were building the dam that created the Jersey City Reservoir. And here it is that paper mill being destroyed, being knocked down. And you can just see the background. There's the, the old Ogden Mansion still standing that was dismantled and rebuilt um, in, in apparently someplace in Whippany. Whippany? This is the earliest map that I know of of Booton. It shows the uh, the route of the of the river, route of the Morris Canal, and in the upper corner is a diagram of how the um, the ironworks appeared very early on in the 1840s. Um, there's only uh, what's identified as a cupola furnace and a rolling mill, but the uh, um, the canal is functioning and the water power from the canal is running both the incline plane uh, and the ironworks in a very complicated arrangement. This all grew together into being uh, a town of um, quite, uh, quite some size and um, an industrial area of uh, intense uh, complications. This is a Sanborn insurance map from the 18, 1886. It shows the ironworks with the blast furnaces and the nail factories and the rolling mill. 
Um, and by this time, the railroad has already come through and come competing with the canal for um, for the business. The inclined plane um, is here. The picture is the uh, this scene in the early 1900s. And uh, by this time, the town is beginning to cover the hill above and um, beyond the um, the ironworks. The complicated situation that, that made all this possible is that the gorge of the Rockaway River, the water is flowing um, this way. Uh, the canal company uh, purchased from uh, William Scott, the owner of the property, the right to build a dam and create a mill pond uh, above the mill site and to uh, <clears throat> Channel the water from the canal is coming down from Powerville and water from the river into the upper level of the canal. They double wide to carry enough water that is going to be able to power the ironworks in the inclined plane. So you can see the water being tapped off here and being used to run the blowing engines for the uh, uh, the blast furnaces and the upper uh and then being collected in a second level mill pond and running the rolling mills and then being passed down a third time and used to run the barrel works and the sawmills and then coming back into the canal again at the bottom. And so um, a lot of that still can be experienced on one level or another. Sir? Did George ask the house, is there any artifacts to the uh huh. Save that question. <laughs> the answer is yes, but I'll have a picture at the end to show you. So, oh, yes. The big steel pipe that carried water down, that is a later version? Well, first of all, it wouldn't be a steel pipe, but there were many, many pipes that carried water to okay. wherever it needed to be the used. came over the arch bridge. Like six foot diameter pipe. You mean the the no? There was a small pipe, not six feet in diameter, that came from the upper pond and came. It was encased in an or a stone. I'm, I'm going to get in trouble because all the experts are back there, and they're going to yell at me. <laughs> there was an arch bridge across the river, um, in this area here. And um, a separate pipe that carried water for fire protection. So it was a whole separate system. Came across the river um, through the stone construction of that bridge, and it's shown on the um, Sanborn maps. And actually, when the um, um, a, a contractor now has messed with the site and destroyed a lot of the pre post. Um, uh, ironworks structures. One of those fire hydrants was actually saved, but we know you know what that pipe was for uh, because it shows up on the Sanford maps. Okay, this is um, now um, as far as the canal is concerned, the canal was being constructed, and one of the most important things was how were they going to work with these inclined planes? Seventeen hundred, almost seventeen hundred feet of elevation change was really going to be a challenge. Uh, digging the canal was not. Um, um, a very difficult situation, but actually uh, how to uh, uh, construct an inclined plane that was actually a, 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 a working, a, a practical working uh, machine was going to be very complicated. And so uh, the first plane was built and uh, operated and demonstrated in Rockaway, and it was not very good. The, the critics were kind, but uh, they were very skeptical as to whether this was all going to work very well. The second inclined plane was, yes. The second one was built uh, in Bootin, and it worked much better. And so um, <laughs> very different from the pictures that we love and know and we see today. The early inclined planes were not very powerful. They were did not work very well, and it took quite a long time to get that technology uh, organized in a fashion that it really worked and made the the, the canal an operating a, a well 
um, operating uh, system. We'll tell that whole story a separate time, but this is a very rare picture and it's from uh, a banknote um, from the Dover Bank uh, in 1832, only a year after the canal was opened. So the second prototype was uh, designed by John Scott, was, so this is a very rare picture. Okay, here is a, a, a panoramic shot of the uh, the canal and Boone and the ironworks um, in probably in the early 1900s. The ironworks uh, early about probably around the turn of the century. Most of these pictures are not that old. The ironworks is still being used by a number of different companies. The canal is still vital in operation and the town of Booton has grown to cover the hill. So it's a huge undertaking in a very busy and bustling town built to support the industrial operations there. Um, moving down along the canal from west to east, we're starting up at the far end of town, up at the end of North Main Street. Here is a view looking up the canal, up as, actually here's the towpath. The canal is over here. Here's the river, looking up the uh, um, <clears throat> the river toward Powerbell and a very unusual structure. There was actually an ice house on the other side of the river that uh, stood back then. Um, moving down closer to town, here's the lock number 12. And here is the, the mill pond and the mill, this is the pond bridge. This is North Main Street up toward um, uh, Mountain Lakes. And here's the lock, and that's now under Santa Land. Completely buried, not visible now, but the route of the canal passes directly through here under the road and heads toward um, the ironworks. Another view of the uh, lock number 13. And there's that ice house across the river again. Lots of interesting things in these pictures to be seen. Uh, I've picked all up some of the best pictures that we have. Some of them are really, um, really lovely pictures. Um, and Bhutan is especially rich in its uh, ability to, to demonstrate, to be able to, to, to uh, um, present this kind of a story with so many things to see. This is the end of uh, lock uh, number 12. And we're looking straight into the lock. There's Main Street going over the top. Here is a, a little walkway that went down under the bridge. It was also narrow and tight so that they had that little walkway so they could pass the uh, um, the, the tow ropes. The, the, the mules would walk around, but there was no way to get a, a tow rope under that bridge so they could rehook up the team and move on. This is the dam, the, the canal company. Uh, the key to this whole system was the fact that they could dam up the, the river uh, create a whole higher level of, uh, of water storage of impoundment and then tap it off to uh, combine with the water coming down from the canal to run the inclined plane and the ironworks. And there's the water control uh, uh, building that allowed water from the river to combine with the water of the canal. Vast amount of water that was all going to be uh, put to use. Looking down, uh, this is all in Canal Side Park now. This is all public property, public park land. There is the, the bridge to the lock. There is the water control building. And then we come to the top of the inclined plane. You can see the um, some of the buildings of that are encroaching upon the, the hillside of the, from the town, the pond, the um, base, the top of the inclined plane. And there are some of the post ironworks uh, industrial structures uh, from the ironwork district below. Here's the top of the inclined plane. And this is this is all very confusing today. I've spent a lot of time walking around here and trying to figure out exactly how the inclined plane set into the landscape. And if you know that area, there is now a parking lot there. And the uh, parking lot sits right on top of the summit of the inclined plane. But these buildings are still extant. They still, they can still see them. You just have to imagine that you realize that the lay of the land has been completely adjusted to 
but this is a wonderful picture. You can see the, <laughs> the summit of the plane and the cable and the, and the rails, um, and it all very nicely in focus. The top of the plane again, with those nice buildings with a cradle car coming over the summit. And then a view looking down the other side. Uh, this is a very steep hillside. The canal, uh, the inclined plane is only, um, is not a very steep slope. It's only like one in 11. So in order to make this work, they really had to notch into that hillside to make that appropriate. So uh, yes. yes. Once again, sir, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Bears. Don't know. Lots of mysteries. You Bootin experts, you know what those poles are for? Mm, okay. Okay. <laughs> Good guess. Okay. Here is a um, canal boat going up at the inclined plane. And I want you to look at the fact that the canal, uh, here's that wall, here's the inside rail. You've got all this extra space for that, that, that banknote picture I showed you. Those were two track planes. Here's room for that second track still there. Here's a line of sleeper stones. The cable is running this way and there's the Aston house. Only feet from the inclined plane, the cable is actually running only feet behind the back door. We'll get back to that. Okay, back to the bottom of the plane. Again, the ironworks is being used by a number of different companies. Here's a colonial ironworks occupying one of the buildings in the back. Cradle car coming down. The brakeman is sitting on top of the rails right there. Another one of those great pictures. Looking um, the bottom of the plane, looking east. Uh, with the railroad coming over the, the above and then coming around the bend, heading toward lock uh, number 13 in the distance. Another shot with some buildings from the coal uh, yard. And there's uh, lock 13. Uh, now, not really under City Hall, but nearby. Nearby, I will show you a picture of where that was. And this is a great picture. A class trip could be. Well, everybody's turned out for the picture. A lot of these pictures were taken in a time when, hey, when somebody was coming with a camera, everybody turned out to get their picture taken. No, no cell phones, you know, no selfies. Anybody, anybody who was going to take your picture was a hero. So yes, everybody has turned out. All the kids are standing there getting their picture taken. Now, remember I said that some of our um, the fondest things come from people like you. Last time we had a meeting in November, somebody came and gave us three pictures. This is one of them. This is a picture we have never, ever seen before. This is a picture of Block 13 again, looking the, from the other direction. And it was in a collection of, of, of things that uh, someone had and thought we would like to, to have and let us um, scan them. There was a transparency, so we have a very expensive fancy uh, scanner that do high res scanning, and so we were able to make a really, really nice image of her. Is that the lock shanty? Mm -hmm. This is the lock tender's house, lock tender's shanty, and that previous picture, the the photographer is standing on that bridge, looking toward the lock, and this picture is looking in the other direction. So, always find something interesting and something new. Okay. Someone recently answered, well, what happens now? Where did the canal go now? Did it go uh, under Myrtle Avenue? Or, Well, this is a marvelous aerial. And again, somebody gave us, thought we would be interested in. Yes, it's very interesting. This is in the 1940s, an aerial view. And there's the canal right along Myrtle Avenue coming up almost to where the town hall is now. Here's Lock then it makes a bend. Of course, what's not on there now? 287. That's a wide swash through all of this. And of course, 
um, the round of the canal through all of this area was completely, completely removed. But you could see Myrtle Avenue following along, only a few places where uh, it makes crossings of the canal. It makes a sharp bend, goes under the over the rail uh, under the railroad, and then the area of the ironworks is hidden behind the tall buildings that sit on the hill above, uh, and then the incline uh, plane would have been below. But those two parallel white lines and all that, two parallel white lines. Here, yes. those are streets. Oh, okay. okay. That's division here and Church Street here, I think. Okay. But you're not sure. And I'm not sure either, but those are the streets that still exist today, of course. <laughs> Do the doctor's buildings? Yes. Yes. Very closely behind. There's a park lot there. <laughs> ah, you're right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. The, the main road going in that direction actually went on the other side there. Yes. And there was um, a, a, a bridge across the river here. That this was an area that was written, there was river and hills and gorge, and it was only very few ways to, to get through here. I think the um, Mr. Erskine's maps, his Revolutionary War maps, showed that hmm, this was a, a gnarly place to get caught in because there were only certain ways that you could you could make your way through this area. Okay, now the Aston House. Uh, it really doesn't show up in many places because people just didn't care about it. It was built in the 1830s. Uh, it was a manager's house for a while, and then it was uh, many people lived there. And then it became a dormitory for workers, and eventually it became a rental, and eventually it, unfortunately, um, very complicated thing. Nobody loved it enough. Very sad. But we had we had pictures of it and we were had uh, several tours and we were able to do some recording and there were some uh, artifacts that were saved. So um, here is the Eston House in that picture I showed you before. And then looking downhill, there's the Eston House from the other side. Here it is uh, in uh, 2005 uh, as a rental unit in relatively decent condition. Somebody is living on these two floors and then there's a, a, another apartment up in the um, half story at the top. No. I, I <laughs> no. That's the whole point. I brightened it up a little bit, but boy, it, it did look <laughs> believe me it's not that good. This building only had one coat of paint. I have the board to prove it. What, so, what was the, the staircase at the back or the side? Remember, that was the only way to reach the the, 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 the attic apartment. There was no stairway from the first and second floor that went to the attic. If there ever had been, it would have been removed. So there's actually you know a, a, a half story up there and it was a separate rental unit. And so finally, those people were were moved out when a, a, a contractor acquired um, the, the two lots that were uh, the heart of the ironworks. And well, he, well, Aston moved from this building up to a nicer location. The two ladies that you're sitting down from you, they know much more about this than I do. They will be able to tell you exactly where. Yeah. Really? Yes. Mr. No. no. Okay, so um, here is the uh, Eston House in 2022. As Beers was observing, it had not survived well. It was being abused. The uh, the um, Ironworks site was in the hands of um, a long time owner and it was uh, in hard times. 
We're fine. Uh, last year in 2023, here is the house about to meet its end. So the um, many of the other structures on the um, Ironworks site have already been demolished. You can see them going to work at it there. And here's the Eston house. It's been uh, it's been gutted. No, no, that, that that would not save it. It had to have a purpose. It had to have a someone willing to take ownership and to use it, um, and how it would fit into the uh, the the space owned by the uh, developer was troublesome. It would be isolated in one corner up against public land in the back, but no place to park. It was very difficult. Yes. I didn't include a diagram of all that, but believe me, we tried. We tried. And so um, for some reason, they saved the windows and they saved uh, the, the little post and a, a number of uh, parts of the house. Yes. <laughs> there was only so much that can be done. Yes. Yes. Okay. And there's a, um, I actually have that board, which I need to uh, donate to you. I, I came across the pile of, when the, when the, when the Eston house was a pile of wood on the ground, I trespassed <laughs> up, <laughs> up onto that pile of wood because I had to have one of those boards. <laughs> And it is nailed, you know, it's still got the nails made in the ironworks stuck in it. And I I do believe that building only ever had one coat of paint <laughs> in all of those years, because there's no, there's only one coat of that dirty old gray paint. So I will bring that to you for your, your archives. Yeah. So we lost that one. But... Um, the inclined plane itself is on town property. And so uh, and to investigate how that property might be put to, to use, uh, the Al Society volunteers visited the site last, um, last year, uh, in the summer and then into the fall, wondering if what remains of the inclined plane might still be there. And so we started probing and digging and scraping. And you can see in the, in the drawing here, there's the inside uh, one of sleeper stones, stone sleepers, sorry. Uh, and we are actually be able to find that line of stones. And not only did we discover that line of stones, but we discovered that it was actually the, um, there's our, our, our crew, Mr. Smith, and there's Tim, and uh, there's, you know, it's covered by a couple of inches of uh, of dirt and leaves, but not too deeply buried. And so with not too much work, we were able to uncover uh, more than 50 feet of those stones. But the unique thing about them was they were actually two tracks wide. Remember that this was a double track plane at one time. And so this was the center of those two tracks. And so those, instead of being single um, track, um, stones, they were double track stones. And so the much more interesting, you don't find that on many places. So there's Mr. Lauf, Mr. Dr. Lauf there, leaning on his shovel. Mm. Oh. And um, here's our line of stones coming up out of the dirt. And I've got the um, um, a little tape measure showing that those are um, almost five feet wide. So, and uh, we kept exposing more and more and more of those. And we hope to go back um, next spring and uncover more. We've got about 50 feet. Uh, well, we, they were uncovered, but now we need to do more work to bring them back up and make that uh, property useful and available to the public. Bill McKelvey. Oh, the door side of these sleeper stones is underneath that slope dirt. Yes. Uh, this is, you know, unless you want to stay for breakfast, <laughs> we can't tell all the stories because the stories go on and the stories go on and the stories go on. Believe me, we've experimented. Uh, Plain Street, which is above, has slipped down and covered half of the plain. And so we would need to dig, you know, into the hillside in order to come to the inside track 
And so we need to talk to the town engineer about that because if we do that, he's going to be annoyed and the, the hill comes down. Yes. 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 But there's a lot of interesting things there. And we've been, I just walked the, uh, the whole property with the, um, uh, conservation committee head, and so um, we talked about the things that that can be done. So stay tuned. Didn't they run a Trump sewer line down the kind of um, Next slide. Okay. Some of the interesting connections that are showing up in these uh, the, the, these these stones. Um, the more we study these things, the more we'll figure out how they were used. Uh, they've been there since the 1830s. It was the second plane that was um, um, uh, the second prototype. Um, they, they, they changed the technology many, many times trying to make it work better. And so all of that uh, is shown in the way that the, 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 the rails were attracted to those stones and by studying more that we can figure out some ways, some of the things of, of, of how that was done. Okay, now. When the canal was abandoned in the uh, um, 19, um, 1930s, one of the first things that um, happened to make uh, the right of way of the canal useful was um, the um, Jersey City Reservoir had been constructed um, and it collected water to be used typed to, to Jersey City, uh, but they hadn't considered the fact that that upstream from Bruton and the reservoir was the towns of Rockaway and Dover and Wharton, oh, doing the things that people doing and dumping it in the river and winding up in the Bruton Reservoir, and that was not very good. And so, um, a, uh, a, 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 a the, the Rockaway Valley uh, sewer. Uh, commission was was created uh, to try to solve that problem with a, a, a trunk sewer that would uh, take that effluent uh, to a, a station uh, that, that that would be located near the Picard Reservoir, and so uh, the right away of the canal was the perfect place to put that that sewer line. And so um, here is the incline number plane number seven and boom being dismantled and the uh sewer line being installed in the right of way of the canal and so here is the canal being uh disassembled the cable is still there they're digging a trench here is they haven't even bothered to remove the uh cradle car yet and here is the um the sewer line being laid in the right of way of the canal and you can see it back in there and here it is blown up and so um, right down the center of all that, below the remains of the inclined plane, there is a, a, a large pipe in place. Beer. And, and they were messing around in Danville. Yes. I called the Rockway Valley Sewer Division, and I got this guy, and he's really, really nice. And then he said to me, can I ask you a Morris Canal question? And I said, <laughs> sure. And he said, my great uncle, Dick Titus, one of our members, year old guy, okay, yes, was a, that's all I told him what I knew about Dick Titus. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't know any of that. Okay, well, just to show you, you never know what you're going to find next in exploring the public property that's still in uh, public hands uh, in Bootin. Um, here is uh, that sewer line blown up really big, and see those those, those it, it's a, 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 the the um, um, the pipe itself has been deconstructed out of uh, terracotta tiles. So if you carefully walk the route of the uh, public property up the plane and into the post industrial um, uh, ironwork section, you find extra pieces of that pipe extant buried in the ground. So. So you need one of those for the museum, but they're heavy. <laughs> You're going to have some trouble getting one. Oh, they're about mm, that big. What's the diameter of that sewer line? 
Well, um, it's got to be about five feet. Here's a rather tall and slender looking um, assistant in the picture, um, the photographer's assistant. So uh, if you can assume he's about f uh, about six feet tall, maybe six foot three, you know, you might place, you know, him. And so, yeah. And it's a big thing. It takes about 12 sections to make the circumference. And so, um, and they are uh, an American uh, SO company, Akron, Ohio, US patent in 1912, 1913. Terracotta. Terracotta, yes. So, you never know what you're going to find. And, <laughs> and there's a picture that. Uh, our friends from Bhutan uh, sent me, again, we love you people, we, we, we share pictures, we share information back and forth, and this is a, one of my favorite pictures of Bhutan because it's very, very, very old. It's probably from the 1880s, and we know that it's somewhere in the 1880s because it shows um, both the soldier's monument uh, put in in the um, 1876, and it also has the woolen mill that was um, silk mill. Sorry, that was built in 1881. But here is upper, uh, looking down Main Street, Bootin, and um, as you can see, uh, well, if you remember this today, this is completely buildings on both sides of the road. The Soldiers Monument is. Got buildings on both sides, and here is a marvelous view looking deeply down a, a dirt main street um, with a marvelous view of the uh, lower ironworks and the uh, railroad trestle going across. So, down, down there. Here's here's the canal, and so it's down below the hill. It's a very steep hill, Bootin. It's not a great place to build a town. It was there because people had to have a place to live. They were coming to work in an ironworks that was going to eventually employ 600 people. So it needed a lot of, it, of, um, of, of, of space to live in. Sir? Where is this building below uh, the monument here? This building? No idea. Any idea? No. Okay. Comment, Bears. Barge Deck Trust. What's that word? Yes, the Bootin, Bootin, the early Bootin branch. It's got, it's got, but then it's got regular trust with the canal one. Mm -hmm. Now, Bill McKelvey is shaking his head. You can look at a picture like this for a week. I don't think so. I think that needs a little more exploration. Okay. That's not a railroad trestle. Okay. Um, well, I'm not even going to wade into that argument. I'm, I'm going to stick with the fact that it's one of those wonderful pictures that you can stare at it for a week and find thing after thing after thing that's, that's really interesting to look at. All right. This is my last slide. So, is there another question? Yeah, that's more my up with the township of Clark, the largest township or county. That is where all the work Okay. I'll just watch your questions. Yeah. Okay. Then that's the end of my presentation. I want to thank you for coming. I want you to thank Janice for making all the arrangements and all the housekeeping. Jim, our oh, the, our technical crew. Uh, we could not exist without our technical crew. It takes three talented guys to make this happen. Mr. Sound, Mr. Video, and Mr. Zoom. We actually have a question for Zoom. Yes. So, uh, on 
on Plain Street uh, at the bottom of the hill where the inclined plane existed, there's a curved wall across the street from the Bethel AME Church. Is that a remnant of the canal, possibly where the canal turned? Yeah. Yes, I know exactly. There, it, um, the um, online caller is asking about some stone uh, walls that are near the bottom of the inclined plane. They're now uh, below Plain Street, the junction of Plain Street and the road that leads into the DPW yard. And so it's down by the salt house where the DPW guys get their, their road salt. And so um, the actual route of the inclined plane goes down through where the road is there now and down onto a much lower level behind the church that he's asking about. So if you go all the way down there, trespass into the DPW yard, you're going to find walls that uh, were part of the um, structure of the bottom of the inclined plane. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sure. Okay. Uh, there's a small parking lot uh, near the corner of um, uh, Plain Street and the road that goes into the DPW is to the right. It's below where the uh, Eston House used to be and that's public property. So the the um, uh, uh, developer's property comes to a point there. That's the, that the inclined plane comes down through there, and it's now fenced off to keep people from hurting themselves. But that's on public property, and we'll be going up in there and opening that up so people can come and and, and see what this is all about. It's going to take some work to do, but uh, we're talking with the folks in Bowdoin to help make that happen. Other thoughts or questions? Okay, I need to thank. Uh, Bobby for salads and Tim for bringing the sandwiches and uh, Janice is flashing the lights which means we have to hustle after party in the office <laughs>